Hello, everybody. My name is Dominic Linz. I'm cardiologist, electrophysiologist from Maastricht in the Netherlands, and I welcome you on behalf of the Arrhythmia Academy to this webinar. We will talk today about a manuscript which has been published at your pace in July 2022 with the title Estimated Incidence of Previously Undetected Atrial Fibrillation on a 14-Day Continuous ECG Monitor and Associated Risk of Stroke. And I'm very happy to also welcome the first author of this manuscript. It's Bill McIntyre from the McMaster University and also the Population Health Research Institute in Hamilton, Canada. Hi, Bill. Hi, Dominic. Nice to see you. Yes. So I'm, I look, actually looked at this uh, manuscript and this was very, very interesting. So maybe it's just possible for you to introduce the main findings and then I'm very, very looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So as we all know, atrial fibrillation screening is something that there's a lot of interest in right now because we know that atrial fibrillation is a common disease. We, have, we know that it's a very strong risk factor for stroke, and we know that there's something that we can do about it. Oral anticoagulation is very effective for this population. We've also got a number of really great tools out there that will help us go out and find atrial fibrillation. But as of right now, we don't have big randomized trial data that shows us that screening is effective. So what we wanted to do in this particular study is try to simulate what screening for atrial fibrillation really could look like using a tool that's become very common in my country, and that's 14-day continuous Holter ECG. So we took data from the ASSERT study. That's a study that I think that most people are familiar with, published in the New England Journal in 2012, where we basically had continuous monitors in patients in the form of a pacemaker. We had almost 2,500 patients. And because a pacemaker records our heart rhythm continuously, we know the rhythm that each of these participants was in over the course of about three years for each patient. So with that in mind, knowing sort of the truth of their history, we aim to go out and simulate atrial fibrillation screening. So what we did here is we randomly sampled 14 day intervals in that period. And we asked the first question, well, how much atrial fibrillation would we pick up? And we anchored this on six minutes because that was the original definition of atrial fibrillation in the assert study and a practical cutoff. And we found that by doing this, just over 3% of participants in the study would have had at least six minutes of AFib picked up by one of these monitors. The second question was, if we did find that much atrial fibrillation, what risk of stroke does that correspond to? In terms of absolute risk, we found a stroke risk of just over 2% per year, 2.18%. And that's something that's above the conventional thresholds of absolute risk that justify oral anticoagulation. And we looked at the relative risk of stroke. We compared the hazard for stroke for that group who had at least six minutes of atrial fibrillation to the group that didn't and found that this roughly tripled the hazard for stroke. The point estimate was 3.02 with a confidence interval ranging from 1.39 to 6.56. So by simulating these Holter monitors, we found that a, a reasonable proportion of the population would have at least six minutes of atrial fibrillation and that it was associated with a high absolute and relative risk of stroke. Well, thank you very much for this uh, nice uh, summary and particularly also congratulations to you and the complete team to putting this um, very interesting analysis together. So what I realized when I read this manuscript is, so the main key point here, it's a simulation study, right? So you did not perform those 14 days holders, but you simulated them. So can you give us a little bit more insight in how the simulation actually works and what kind of techniques without going in too much detail uh, you actually applied there? Yeah, so uh, thank you. For your compliments. So indeed, it was a simulation study. So I think it's important first to look at what are we sampling from and 
as I mentioned previously, these are patients who all had pacemakers and they had about three years of follow-up each. So we know at any given moment in time if they were in atrial fibrillation or in sinus rhythm. And the important things here is that when we did go to do our simulation, we wanted things to be random, but we also didn't want to be subject to random error. So what the computer did, it would basically randomly choose a 14-day window within that three years and look for atrial fibrillation. And of course, it would count up how many minutes or hours of atrial fibrillation we saw within that 14-day window. That was the random part. But of course, when you are going random, you can be subject to random error. So what we did to really increase the confidence in each of these random guesses was repeat that 1,000 times per patient and then look basically at the average across those 1,000. And that way it was random in the fact that it was subject to chance what we had simulated and picked, but it also wasn't vulnerable to uh, small numbers. Yes, so this actually means that there was this random, but on the other hand, also quite systematic approach of simulating. 14-day um, holders. So I know that actually this performed in a lot of centers, but um, it would be much more handier, of course, just to do one-day or two-day holder, or otherwise, if available, even longer monitoring. So can you give us a little bit uh, in information about what is now the best duration of holtering in this kind of population, for example, to find or not find atrial fibrillation? Yeah, I think that that's a great question. And I think that that's something that we all struggle with uh, very much, right? If we were to go to look at uh, the extremes of things, we know that when you screen just with continuous monitoring, as they did in the loop study in Denmark, that actually did not turn out to be um, effective for stroke prevention. At the other extreme end of that spectrum, uh, there are studies that have gone with single time point screenings, um, including with repeated single time point, like the strokes, stroke stop studies. And those have actually suggested that atrial fibrillation screening is efficacious with uh, those shorter methods. This all relates down to something that uh, I refer to as the AF burden paradox. And the idea is that the longer you sample for when you're looking for atrial fibrillation, the more likely you are to find it. However, it seems that the risk of stroke associated with any given episode of atrial fibrillation seems to be inversely proportional to the effort you've invested it to go looking for it. That is to say, I don't think we've yet found what is really the sweet spot. Uh, and that may differ population to population. Here, we just looked at a uh, one conventional cutoff with one conventional tool. But uh, there are certainly a whole bunch of other possibilities. Yes. So I think if I understand you correctly, what you're referring to, if you have a patient with a very, very high atrial fibrillation burden, you have a very good chance to detect this, even maybe with just an occasional ECG recording or with a 24-hour holder. If you need to record, for example, 30 days to find those six minutes of atrial fibrillation, this actually indicates that this is a patient with an overall lower atrial fibrillation burden. And we need to be aware, right? So the longer we need to monitor to find AF, the more likely it is that the overall burden is quite low in this given patient. Um, concerning the population, so this, of course, was a specific population, right? So if I um, summarize this, I think it was um, above 65 with hypertension. Chet's vast was quite high with actually uh, four or something, and they had a pacemaker. So this is not uh, the, the 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 overall representative uh, population in an AF outpatient clinic, for example, right? So would you expect comparable results um, and and also information about those six minutes atrial fibrillation in in a different population with lower chats mask, or do you think that's specific for this population? Yeah, I think that that's a really good question. Um, I think that the age, having hypertension, the CHADS mask in other places 
uh, and other studies in the literature, we've seen some similar signals, right? But the really big question here is having a pacemaker. If you have a pacemaker that tells us that there's something fundamentally different about your heart rhythm um, and your conduction, and that's where you don't know if you can make the leap to the generalizability uh, for the larger population that way. Yes, no, that's right. Um, so now about anticoagulation and the res uh, results of those uh, findings and also the impl implications, right? So um, imagine you find now with a 24-hour hold to six minutes of atrial fibrillation during systematic approaches. No? So, so not actually just by chance because you did this for palpitation screening. So this would suggest this would be symptomatic AF, but you just do this really in a in a screening setting do we need to anticoagulate this now don't we have to anticoagulate this now you showed actually it is associated with a higher risk of stroke if a patient has six minutes of af but is this just a risk marker or modifiable risk factor which requires eventually more the anticoagulation yeah I, i think that's a great question a note first, I think that's helpful on anticoagulation in this study is that almost nobody in this study actually got oral anticoagulation because of when it was conducted. So this is one of the very few studies um, where you could see true background rates of, of stroke without oral anticoagulation. If you were to do something like this in, in our working environment today, I think that you might feel much more compelled to react and uh, anticoagulate the patients with any degree of atrial fibrillation. With respect to really what it means uh, if there's a risk for stroke, it, there's a risk for stroke, but whether or not that is responsive to oral anticoagulation, and of course, what is the absolute and relevant, or the relative benefit that you stand to gain is what is really out there in terms of uh, the jury right now. We're currently doing the Artesia study. And when we plan the Artesia study, which looks at people who have a pacemaker and have somewhere between six minutes and 24 hours of oral anticoagulation, we powered that study with the understanding that for this subclinical atrial fibrillation, the absolute risk of stroke is not as high as for a patient who is otherwise identical in terms of their age and CHADS VAS score with so-called clinical atrial fibrillation detected by surface EKG. Now, the risk is still certainly high enough that it causes a problem for this population, but the relative risk is what we're really out there looking for. If we do get the same relative risk in terms of oral anticoagulation uh, for stroke prevention, then we do stand to have the population benefit. The second really big issue that comes in there is the safety, right? When it comes to our patients with subclinical atrial fibrillation, we do have reason to believe that they might overall be more frail and at higher risk of bleeding. So it's going to be about balancing those two things. Uh, there's two clinical trials in this space. I mentioned Artesia. I think that we can uh, look forward to the results of Artesia either very late this year in 2023 or early in 2024. But uh, if uh, you're to Google press releases, I think you would also know that uh, the NOAA trial, which was done in a similar similar population, was actually stopped both for futility on efficacy and for evidence of uh, harm. So I think that there's some really good answers that are going to be forthcoming uh, in the next calendar year about really what the role is of uh, oral anticoagulation in these populations. Yes, absolutely. Noah, Artesia, I think those are two very important studies uh, which actually will give us a lot of information um, how to handle and how also to manage those patients. And again, anticoagulation never comes for free, right? So there, there is a risk of bleeding, A risk of other complications and so again the, it, it's still open whether all of those AF episodes or also high rate episodes actually need to be anticoagulated or not I think that's very important pacemakers loop holter 
but they are also those mHealth devices and wearables. So what what is your thought about this? Do we still do holders in the future or is this replaced by wearables and apps and things like this? Do we need to redo a lot of studies? So what are your thoughts in, the, in this field? Because it will change the field. The field will change. Absolutely. The the field is going to change. And you're, you're talking to me uh, today from the Netherlands where I think that you've done a much better job than we have so far of integrating these M Health tools, including the ones that are ECG based and the ones that are not ECG based um, at this time. I think that that line of uh, inquiry is probably going to evolve in a few phases. Uh, as I mentioned previously, I think the results of Noah and Artesia are going to tell us. Um, a lot about the potential burdens of atrial fibrillation that may correspond to risk. There's also over a dozen randomized uh, control trials going on right now that are looking at atrial fibrillation screening versus no screening and have collected stroke as an outcome, usually not as a primary outcome, but uh, as, as an outcome nonetheless because individual trials make it very hard for from a power point of view. So there is a uh, large consortium, actually a, a double uh, consortium or two. So there's the AF Screen Group, which is a, an international consortium, and the Affect EU Group, which is uh, having the benefit of a Horizon ZU grant. And what these folks ha have all done, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it, is planned prospectively an individual participant data meta-analysis of the ongoing screening trials. And of course, through the screening trials, we have things that are at, at the extremes of monitoring, like the loop study that I had mentioned previously. There's ones that are using watch-based technologies, single time point screening technologies. And uh, with the power of individual participant data meta-analysis, we hope to really explore Uh, the factors that may modulate the efficacy of screening, including uh, how you screen for atrial fibrillation, the health system that it's done in, and the underlying characteristics of the population. And I think that we could probably expect other groups to continue to do work to answer questions like, if I am to do a 14-day halter, but then uh, along the same side, just do intermittent 30-second EKGs, what's what's comparable in terms of the times and the findings and we will uh we will look to that to continue uh to inform our practice as our technology curve evolves yes i think the, the there will be a dynamic change and also adaption of how to monitor most of those patients and yeah this will be just exciting right so holter is and will stay of course it will stay but but i think there will be a lot of alternatives also And our patients will start to use those alternative um, ways of monitoring their own rhythm and, and their own atrial fibrillation at some stage. And I think there, of course, we also have to think about how to deal with this, how to manage the data, but particularly also how to manage those patients where just uh, by chance, for example, atrial fibrillation is detected. So, Bill, thank you very much for this uh, nice summary of this um, yeah, very interesting manuscript uh, published in Europace. And yeah, I'm looking forward for future studies also coming from you and from your team. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dominic, for having me uh, here today. And I look forward to continuing the discussion with you, both in this forum, on Twitter, and uh, wherever else we may meet. <laughs>